We're going to be going into practical application of the word. One of the things my pastor years and years ago, way back before there were cars, you know, way back, he was a revival preacher. If you guys know who Brother Shambach was, um, or Brother A.E. E. Allen even farther back, my pastor, uh, Alan Cyrus, was under the school in A.E. E. Allen in what we call Miracle Valley in, in California. He attended school under the tents back in those days. So when I met him, I mean, gosh, he was like 75. I thought that was old because I was only 23. But this guy could minister, and he knew the Bible backwards and forwards. He says, there's only one guy that knows the Bible that really I, I envy, and this is my pastor saying this, and that was uh, J. Finnis Dake. J. Finnis Dake, if you get a chance to read his Bible, he's got a great teacher's Bible. J. Finnis Dake went to Booty Bible, Bible Institute, and he was noted for he could quote Genesis all the way to Revelation by heart. And it took him a while, and he was just going and going and going. If you look at his notes, he spent 150,000 hours putting the notes together, dealing with just about every subject. You get a chance, look him up. He's a good person, okay? Now, it's like anything else. Bible notes are Bible notes. Never to be replace the Bible. So there are people that are going to have opinions of Scripture. Learn to eat the hay and spit out the sticks. Say amen. All right. So a couple of things I want to give you. First of all, how important is it to study the word? So I gave you a sheet. If you get a chance, take it and let it, put it in the leaflet of your Bible. That's the take home. But it's the last part I want to share with you. What? Uh, they're right up here. Yeah. So get it afterwards if you want. Here's the thing that I want you to understand. When you're studying Bible, either by yourself, or you're doing it in a group like this, or maybe somewhere else in a good place that, that gives out the word, there's a couple of things when you're studying the Bible that you need to put into place. For Number one, okay, the historic setting. When you're reading scripture, you need to know what was the whole historic setting. You know, was it the time of Daniel? Or was it the time of Noah? historic setting. Then you need to know what testament it is in. For example, Jesus said, you know, to the woman at the well. So you look at the setting and you relate it to the testament. Why the testament? Because in the Old Testament, they were believing for Jesus. They were looking towards the coming of Jesus. They had no God living on the inside of them. Hello. In the New Testament, Jesus has showed up. He died, rose again, sits at the right hand of the Father, sent us the Holy Spirit to teach us his word, but God lives in where? He lives in our heart. And because he lives in our heart, there's a whole new set of rules. You no longer are a believer in God. You're not only a believer in God, but you're a child of God, and you're indwelt by God. And a lot of times when Christians, and I hope several people that said they would be watching will help you, when Christians vacillate from the New Testament to the Old Testament, and from the Old Testament to the New, without understanding the historical settings, their walk will become shaky. If you don't believe me, read Galatians. The book of Galatians was written to help the people who are being coerced to go back into the Judaism belief system, which lacked one thing, Messiah in our heart. <laughs> Why would you, once you have Messiah in your heart, go backwards and serve a God through actions without faith, rather than through works, rather than through faith? All right. Well, we wouldn't. So the first thing, historic setting, what testament is it in? Got to take a sip of this. Two, the context in which it is speaking, how does it relate, and what does it relate to? For example, the time, what was going on, to whom was it spoken to or applied, right? You got to know. If Jesus is speaking to Peter, okay, we, you want to know. And if Jesus is speaking to a, a Gentile, 
You need to know. Okay, then the third thing is how does it apply to me? You need to take that scripture in its setting, in its context, and say, how can I apply that scripture to me? You know, that scripture could point out what you're missing, what you need to improve on, which is okay. We're supposed to line up with scripture. Or it might show you something that God says is yours, you didn't know it. Like the man who came over to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> over to America years ago. True story in the Reader's Digest. He spent all that he had so he could come over here, establish a life, and send for his family. So all of his savings went into the ticket. Got on the boat and certainly almost here to come to America. He's almost here a couple of days and the, the, he's here. And the captain of the ship noticed that he would always sit by himself and pull out a sack and carve cheese and eat crackers. And he, he finally decided, I'm going to ask him. So we went down there and he says, sir, did we offend you that you sit off by yourself and you eat crackers and, and everything, which, no offense, you know, I'm sure they're good. And he says, oh, no, sir, I spent all that I had just to get a ticket for, for in a room on this boat. And I don't have any more for food. And the captain looked at him, and this is what I'm telling you, too. The captain says, oh, sir, don't you know that the meal comes with the ticket? And so a lot of times we, we can be shown in the word something that we didn't know existed there or, or seen it in a different way. That's why we look at the scripture so that the Holy Spirit could then take us on a journey into that word and make it a living reality. Someone say amen. That's what studying the word is really about, not reading some dry words off a page. All right, and then again, how does it apply to me? Okay. All right, and then fourthly, finally, go to God about it. See, if, you're, if it's pointing out, hey, you really need help, don't freak out. Take that word and go to God with it and say, God, I need your help. You need to help me rise to this occasion. You say, I can. See, people all have flaws. If we don't take our flaw and be honest before God with it, find scripture and appropriate it, and don't ask God to help us, we're going to carry that flaw a long time. And people are constantly appointed out to you. And you know what it can do? It could actually ostracize you from people. Like, for example, um, what was his name? Uh, the very uh, mindset guy, scientist that couldn't, you know, Albert Einstein. Bless his heart, so smart. Yeah. And... and so Albert Einstein, using this as an example, not a bunch of people, developed in his thinking, but had no development in his speaking. He could not relate to human beings. So everybody tried to talk to him and relate to him, and he, they just thought he was a freak. And listen, God wants us rounded. Sure, we may have certain gifts that we're really good at, but if all you do is stick your head into a one gift, and that's all you do, but you don't know how to talk to people. You don't know how to relate in business. You don't know how to work your finances. See, so one area you're really good at, and some of these other areas you're not so good at. So if you'll find an area in your study of the word that you need some improvement, what should you do? Anybody? Bueller? Anybody? <laughs> huh? You take the scripture, you say, God, I'm convicted. And you go before the Father and say, Lord, help me. You're not a sinner. You're not a bad person. You're just somebody that's hidden that problem. And maybe you're afraid to talk to God about it. Do. You'll find out that's your freedom. Say amen, somebody. So lastly, if you're falling short, go to God about it. Find the scripture. Appropriate it. If you, if you see a vision, you're inspired by the word. Lord, help me to get there. Seek and you shall. Knock and the door shall be open. There's a word for Scott right there. All right, so let's get into it. First one to, of this series is called Appropriating His Promises. Amen. I heard an old sermon years ago when I first was saved. 
dad and I went to a full gospel businessman fellowship and we heard how to appropriate the promises of God. And it was such a simple message. Yet remember, God does things in a way that are profound, but they're simple. That's God. He said the gospel, even a child can understand, right? So the enemy would say, oh, now, you know, some of this stuff is a little bit more than you can handle. Well, when you go into the Bible and you study the Bible like tonight, don't apply your head. Don't unplug it either. Don't reason it. Don't be the kind of undisciplined person that when I'm reading or saying something, your mind goes off somewhere and miss what I say. There's certain disciplines. And Jesus quantified that when he said, those with ear le ears, let them what? Okay. All right. So let's get into this. I'm going to read the paragraph. You have the paragraph with me. So I believe today's Christians should be some of the most excited people in the whole world. Amen? Their insurance is paid up. Christ's mutual life, those benefits are out of this world. While the systems of the earth are shaking, Hebrews tells us we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And our walk should be solid. Say amen. The Bible says that we hear his sayings and we do with them. We're like a man, a wise man, that builds his foundation on a rock. Now, what's neat about it, if you look at the Old Testament example, the rock that followed them, that rock was Christ. Well, the foundation for under our feet moves with us. In other words, you're not just standing on a rock. <laughs> you got to move. You got to do things. And if you're obeying God, Christ is right up under there supporting you. His word is right up under there supporting you. So you need to know the word. Can you say amen? All right, so that rock that followed them. So in this lesson, we will show you how to get a hold of the things promised you to bring them out of the spiritual realm, that's where they happen first, and manifest as promised in the physical realm. It's one, of, one thing to have a pie in the sky in the by and by. I love that phrase. But how about a little steak on our plate while we wait? Amen? God gave us grace down here so that we could walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And we could fear no evil. Why? Because God lives in us. And just like I use the illustration, I use it over and over and again. If you're walking with Jesus, nobody's going to pound on you. The trouble is, most of the time we're walking for Jesus and not walking with Jesus. Do you understand the difference? If we're walking for Jesus, we're ahead of him. We're doing it for Jesus. And I can almost hear him hilariously say, please. <laughs> let Jesus take the forefront. Remember, you're built into him. And let him guide you through life. Can you say amen? For in him we live, we move, and have our existence or being. All right, so let's read on a little further. We got steak on the plate while we wait, but how do we get a hold of it? So some of us are waiting on answers to our prayers and the manifestation of those physical things that are promised. So let us tap some of the wisdom that comes from above and the hand of God and honors Christ's blood covenant. Everyone say, I have a blood covenant. God's word is true. Let every man be a liar. I need to line my life up with the word. And God will grace me and favor me before men and before his father. Okay, in Jesus' name, do you believe that? If not, just go, don't say anything. All right, so, all right, so one of the things I want to give you is two scriptures you can look up later, Isaiah 66, 1 through 3, something to remind you about the word, and Isaiah 55, 11 through 15. Well, they're not in your notes, so just put those down. Write those down. You open your Bibles to Psalms 103, 1 through 5. Now, let me ask you this question. Why did God constantly require the Israelites to do things like the feasts? Every year they had to do the priests. Every year they reminded of their sins, and they had to have the sacrifice over the, 
the, uh, uh, the congregation of the people? What was that for? To bring them to remembrance, because one of the things that humans tend to do is forget. I know people today are suffering in their walk because they forgot some of the basic truths that they once were taught. You see, one thing you need to realize, and for those coming in, this is really a key. When, when somebody teaches the word, doesn't matter if it's somebody good like John Hagee or, or one of your favorite teachers, you know, I think every prideful person should sit under Joyce Meyer and let her just whack at you for a while about your attitudes and stuff. And I bet I tell you, men hate that. <laughs> you can see where the pride is. You know, hey, sit under Joyce Meyer, put, put some earphones on you and make you listen to it for five hours. <laughs> It'll kill everything that's bad in you. I'm just joking. There's some great teachers out there. Faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing and hearing by the word of God. Why do we need to search the scripture? Because we all need to be reminded of God's promises and how to appropriate them, right? Ask and you shall. Seek and you shall. Knock and the door shall be. So therefore, he that seeketh finds he that asks, receives, and he that knocks, it is open to him. So tonight we're opening, asking God to open his scripture to us and let us see how to appropriate what he promised us and how did he get it into the physical realm where it needs to be. You see, I can't wear faith shoes, but by faith I can believe for shoes and they will show up. Right, right at the moment, I remember years ago, it was Linda that did this. At one of my first churches, um, I bought a, a refrigerator freezer for the food bank. But it needed to be delivered in about a week. And so I told everybody in the congregation, this is a long time ago, so she's off the hook. I told everybody in the congregation, hey, we got a new freezer. And of course, some people are going to say, well, where is it? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And I looked at her and I says, where's what? He says, where's the freezer? She wanted to make sure I wasn't lying. I says, I'm holding the bill of sale. It just haven't manifested yet. Now, did you hear how I said that? You're holding the bill of sale. His name is Jesus. He searched the scripture and begin to present the scripture. Everyone say this with me. Heavenly Father, your word says, if I believe I receive, I shall have it. Okay, see, immediately when you say that, your spirit's going, yeah. But your head's going, oh, oh. And that's where you learn right at that moment not to speak. <laughs> From your head. Because a double-minded person, from the head to the spirit, from the spirit to the head, head to the spirit, air, spirit, air, that's a double-minded person. You know, it's not a person who has two heads. No, it's a person that thinks in the natural and then thinks in the spiritual. So they'll go to church, listen to me, and get all fired up. Man, they're in the spirit. And then three or four things will happen through a couple of days, and now they're in the natural. <laughs> I'm going to put myself in the spiritual. Well, the idea behind that is to wear you out. But we understand, don't we, that we need to be more spiritual minded than carnal minded. Say amen, somebody. All right. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Verse 1, Psalms 103. And all that's within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not. Everyone say, forget not. Forget not all of his benefits. Verse 3, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. So it's giving us a God view. As far as God's concerned, he forgives all iniquities and he heals what? All diseases. So the problem of unbelief is not in God's point. The problem is 
God is us. But think about it. God is not up there, and people believe this. God is not up there to say, well, you've been a bad boy, Carrie, so you're not going to get your blessings. But Scott is, you know. Billy back there, you, you got to watch that guy. You follow what I'm saying? We think that it's because of something we did or didn't do. No, it's not something that we did or didn't do. It's how we approach God. And often, what we understand to be the truth. Say amen. All right, so forget not all his benefits, who forgives all iniquities, who heals all diseases, who redeems your life from destruction. We're supposed to be coming to church and walking with God, and you're supposed to be more and more walking with Jesus in peace, in pastures that are green, by still waters. Your soul is supposed to be restored, say amen, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Aren't you glad? Loving kindness and tender mercies. That's how God views you. What do you say about Job? Read Job. The devil came in and said, hey. And, and God says, hey, have, did you see my servant Job down there? And he said this. There is none like him. He's a really cool dude. I, my translation. Yet if you look at his life, it's a mess. But see, in God's view, he thinks and he believes the best in you. Hello. That's why the devil gives us, when we trip or fall, a lot of us fell hard. First thing the devil tells you, well, you, you can't get up, you know. <clears throat> <clears throat> you don't know who you're going to trust, what's going to go on, the whole head game. Just get up. Go to God and say, boy, do I need help. And God says, all right. I'm glad you recognize that. Again, I'm glad you recognize the voice. All right, let's go on. Then it says, who redeems your life from destruction, crowns your life with loving kindness and, and mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things. Everybody thinks that's food. No, that means that you don't run around cussing anymore. <laughs> you don't go around sourpussing and complaining. Hello, grumbling. Ladies, watch out. I've been hearing some people, you're asked to do something, first thing comes a grumble. You just lost your reward. Sit back down. Careful of that. God's watching, especially when revival like this is starting to break out. He's watching everything so we don't step out. We don't want to step out. Say amen. We want to step in. <laughs> hey, the pool is warm. Step in. All right, so let's look at this. I have six points here. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. In other words, he helps you talk right so that your youth is renewed like what? The eagle. Now, look at yourself in that mirror. Can you see that you're getting younger? Are you happier? Should be if you're walking with Jesus. He... Even though our outward person it perishes, Scripture says our inward man is renewed day by day. So you are getting newer and newer inside. And that needs to bleed out in our attitudes, in the way we talk to people. Say amen. And the Word of God is going to help us with that. All right, point one. Church, when we believe in God, we give God the credit and bless His holy name. God loves it. He doesn't want to share credit with anybody. Two, we as humans will sometimes forget all the benefits, or maybe just some, and we don't apply the Word of God, and that's what's needed to apply the Word of God, especially in your finances. Some people say, well, I really hope God's going to come through with my finances. Well, if you really read about finances, God wants you to take a step of faith. You're going to have to trust Him to give so He can give back. Now, you think about your life. It wasn't until you gave your life to God that he started working in it. As long as you kept your life to yourself, whoever that might be, then it seems like nothing works. You know, a real selfish person will do it their way and in their time and think they're doing it for God. Don't do it your way. Find out how it's to be done. 
and don't do it in your time. Find out when it's to be done. You go to God about that. Say amen. All right, two. Are you with me? Everybody here, so we're humans. We need those benefits. Three, God's benefits are to those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes and amen. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Remember, there's two of us. Word people. There's two of you. There's the old you and the new you. The old you doesn't want to be in church. Doesn't want to lift its hands. Doesn't want to have a good attitude. Amen. And the Bible says you need to crucify that thing first thing in the morning. Amen. And then what you pull around with you should either shield you or help you communicate in the earth, but it shouldn't be in your way serving God. Say amen. Fourthly, remember there are two. So carnal man, spiritual man, man of the flesh, man of the spirit. Point five, God pulls us out from destruction and crowns our life with loving kindness. If we have a relationship with God in his word and with God, people should see that God's kindness is on us. His love is on us. What's the fruit of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, temperance, gentleness, and faithfulness. I think I got all nine. Amen. That should be coming out of us. Coming out of our words and out of our eyes. You should be the greatest loving person. Say amen. Because the God of love lives in you. You should have a lot of joy, even under pressure. Why? Because your joy doesn't come by what you accomplish. It helps. But in who you know and how your walk's doing. I tell you what, I'm addicted to meeting with God in the morning. I cannot start my day without that. I actually look forward to it. Before I know, I mean, it's just, man, it's, and it gets rich. And then when I get going, everything's kind of prayed for, the birds start joining in. It is the funniest thing. But, you know, it's like God and, and myself's private time where we become friends and we get reassured to trust him. Say amen. So, so he pulls us out of destruction. He puts loving kindness as a crown on our head. And then sixth, the results of restoration and healing in our life, the health and the full life should be because of the result of our relationship with Jesus. He said, when you go in and pray like you're supposed to, that God will reward us openly. Amen. In other words, everyone will see that you have a good relationship with God. Why? Because you're not slapped all around anymore. What do you mean? Well, there's a lot of Christians that all they know is uh, hurt and, and frustration. And something's going wrong and going this. Hey, wait a minute. That doesn't sound like the kingdom of God. It sounds like somebody's way ahead of Jesus trying to do it for the Lord or believe it for the Lord. Listen, let's t come over here and let's teach you how to rest. Let's teach you how to be busy for God yet at peace and rest while you're doing it. Say amen. That's what the word will do in our hearts. So let's learn a little bit more of this. Go with me to 2 Corinthians in your notes. Chapter, uh, 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 chapter 1, verse 20 and 22. How do we appropriate God's promises? All right. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him what? Amen. I remember a brother not, not so long ago asked me a good question. It's a good question to ask. I wish people asked me more questions. They don't. They don't know what to ask. They don't know when to ask it. And the funny thing is, there are, your life is filled of choices and answered questions. So ask a lot. Not questioning God, but ask questions about things you want to know. God's more willing to tell you. Remember, he shall show us things to come. Are you with me? So, for all the promises of God in him are what? Yes, and in him, amen. To the glory of God through us. 21. Now he is, who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has raised us up and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. 
Did you know that God made a guarantee in you? So here's how it works. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become saved, born again. As you put your mind in the Word and renew the programming in your mind, your mind s stops resisting God so much, and the mighty God that lives in you is able to carry out into your outer life, and your life shows favor and shows anointing. It's like Sunday, you know, did, all I did is point and speak, and the lady got her hand healed. It's just how it works. And he sent forth his word, and he heals them. As, you, as long as you stay consistent with God, God's presence is going to build in you. But you've got to keep your head in Scripture so your head don't go off into some ozone land. Can you say amen? Or the devil lays some trip on you. Well, the pastor's picking on you, you know, or whatever. And so you, you don't entertain things like that. Why? One time God, I was, I was praying, and then I took, a, you know, a drink of my, uh, my coffee and a little bite of my cereal, and I would just rest it for a minute. And my head started thinking about some things that need to change. And God says, why are you letting that fill your head? Why do we allow certain things? And he's talking to me now, not you. I says, Lord, yeah, that's right. He said, sometimes we let things dwell in our head way too long that you really can't do anything about, but you wish you could. He says, that's not me. Nor do I want you to occupy your head about things like that. I want you to occupy your head. Think about scripture. Think about the blessings I've done for you. Boy, that really, really helped me right there. So this is all about Bible study on the word. So make sure you, when you're studying, your head doesn't go out on vacation. <laughs> Amen, because it will. I mean, oh, about 20 minutes in, I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat. Yeah, it's just a joke, but still, you know. So, all right, you with me? So, remember, it's God who establishes us, and he does it by his word. All right, time with God reveals his heart. People often will talk for God. Now, listen to me carefully but they don't represent really how God is. They're talking about how they think God is. Remember the man with the one talent? He thought God was mean. He thought God was unfair because he was God. He reaped where he sowed not, and he, he gathered where he did not, you know, plant. So the man had this concept of God, hey, I don't want to do anything wrong, so I'm just going to hold on to his money. And that's where a lot of Christians are. They don't understand through his word that God loves us so much. Come on, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world, world to condemn the world. You see, a lot of preachers are condemning the world. A lot of these prophets are condemning. And Jesus didn't come to condemn. He come to gather and save. You understand? And see, I, it took me a while to understand. Because I thought I had to slap my congregation into shape. <laughs> you know, get into their personal business. Follow them home. Here's one. I didn't think this. But I knew a, I had a pastor that did until he repented. He used to go and follow his elders home and kick over their garbage cans in the weekend, see what they've been doing. Can you imagine that? Oh, moving right along. I thought I'd throw that in for fun. See, my job is not to get in and what you've been doing. My job is to encourage you to get with God. Then I know you're going to be doing good. Say amen. All right, so time with God reveals his heart. The reason why a lot of Christians don't know God's heart is they don't spend the time they need to with God in the presence and in his word. So he said, abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear forth fruit unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. See, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides makes his home in or dwells with abides with me, and I in him bears much fruit. 
People that start producing and things start coming together, it's because they're spending more time with God. It's not because they got the quotes right and they got the principles right. No, they're spending time with God. Because grace covers our mistakes. And the more grace we get in, the less mistakes we make. Because we become graceful. You don't want to bring your dog in a china shop, especially if it's a pit bull, you know, or some big dog with a long tail. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Well, sometimes Christians are just like that. They're whacking everything. They're fighting the devil. They're just tearing. Their whole life's falling apart. They're sick inside, not feeling good. Hello? God wants you to walk with them. So he can restore us. So he can bring our life out of destruction. Say amen. So in verse 5 it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, here's something to always remember, you can do nothing. Oh, how special am I, God? Amen. So... That's the idea. The Bible warns us not to think more highly than we ought to think, but to think soberly. The Bible also says that he that thinketh he stands, take heed lest he. So being humble and submitted to God and his word is key. Say amen. A couple of points. Number one, church is our exposure to God. And as we are with him, the changes in us and changes us so that we can become more like him. That's why the enemy keeps us so busy to stay in God's presence or to read his word too. The word says we are risen with Christ and are seated with him where? In heavenly places. We cannot fight the enemy in our own circumstances by raising our voice and getting all frustrated. Thirdly, we're all have importance in life. Have you found that importance? Stick to it. Listen, if you don't like kids, stay out of the nursery. Stop wasting all your time trying to be better in the nursery if you can't stand being in the nursery. Find some things you're good at and be good at them. And then stay out of the kitchen if you can't cook. Hello? <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to get frustrated and that frustration bleed over. Amen. There's some things I'm not very good at. You don't see me doing them. I ask other people to do them. That's where the smarts come in. You can work hard or you can work smart. Hard workers die early. Smart workers, maybe they're hard workers, but they work smart, live long, and enjoy what they do. Amen. <laughs> New proverb. Okay, let's move right on. Thirdly, we have importance in life. Find it. Fourthly, the key to understanding about God, and I'm speaking about God, we have to have that face-to-face -face relationship. Well, the Lord came down and walked with Adam. What a privilege. And Adam, I'm sure, asked him all kinds of questions. Now well, think about it. You and I have the same thing. At Pentecost, God came. We have Jesus in our heart. God comes and walks and talks. Every time you get up in the morning, God's waiting for you to talk to him. He wants to impart good things to you. Share encouraging words through the word. Bring back to remembrance some of the things maybe you read some time ago. He wants to create a friendship with us. Oh, but, you know, we can, we can allow that to happen. Say amen. And then fifthly, Christians think if they work hard at it, pray more, read the Bible more, then God and follow God's steps, God will meet their important needs. Listen, if you're having a problem getting your prayer need, check your bases. How many here's ever played baseball? When you hit a home run, you got to hit the bases. You got to touch the bases and get back to the plate. And what a lot of people want to do is they, want to, they know they hit a home run. They know they're blessed, 
but they don't check their bases. And because they don't check the bases, they're thrown out. Hello? And we want to check the bases. We don't get thrown out from God, but it seems like we get thrown out from the game momentarily. Have to regroup. God help me. All right, moving right along. Listen to this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians, not 2nd. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, and one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for a prize is temperate, balanced in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we as an imperishable crown. Verse 26, therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body, bring it into subjection, lest at any time I preach to others, I myself should become a castaway or just disqualified. What's he talking about? He's not talking about you going out to the gym and losing weight. He's talking about when you're dealing with spiritual matters, you don't fight in the carnal flesh. You're not shadow boxing. Hello. You fight in the spirit. How do you pulverize the devil every day? Speak the name of Jesus. Say, I praise the Lord. Every time you do, you're shooting the devil with a bolt of God's anointing because you're proclaiming God. Hello. Most people don't know that. But my pastor taught me, he says, you want to get in, even with the devil, if he seems to be getting you, get in the word, get into, in the presence of God, and then start praising the Lord and laughing. You'll beat the tar right out of him. He says, that's not the reaction I'm looking for. <laughs> Let's move right on. Are you still with me? So you don't fight as one beats the air. You bring yourself in subjection to God. Amen? Romans 12, 1 through 3. Get a chance to read it. Oh, I got it right down here. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, your spirit man, present your flesh, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Let me translate. Okay? Holy and acceptable. Holy means you have to put your flesh over a side so he can zap it. Holy means put aside. When you're holy, it doesn't mean you're perfect. It means set aside for the master's use. So when you take off your jacket, and you often do what with it? You set it aside or hang it up, right? When you take off your old man, what do you do? You set it aside. Let God press it, clean it, zap it, kill it, then pick it up, put it on, it will serve you. But if you don't do that, it won't be what? A reasonable sacrifice. Hello? It won't be, see, because in order for us to walk in the spirit, it says it is our responsibility to lay our flesh down every day. That's what it means. Your reasonable service or what's expected of you to do. God doesn't strip your body off you, does he? No, you have to lay it aside. Amen. So, all right. So, there we go. A couple of points. Number one, we are Christians can't just exist from day to day. And many do. I wonder what's going to happen today. No prayer. No desire to serve God. They're just existing. What happens to even most pristine water if it sits long enough? Hey Amen. If you sit too long, even you will get stale. And then you'll be stale to others. You'll get resentful. You start uh, dreading things. and You don't want to get stale. Say amen. I don't want to go into too much detail. It just kind of gives me the chills. Number two, we can't wander around without purpose. We must daily apply the word, 
then having done it, done all to stand, we stand, right? All right. We don't stand for something will fall for anything. Thirdly, we must have strong convictions. Guys, know what a conviction is? Some people don't. They don't understand the difference between condemnation and conviction. If God's dealing with you in an area, you won't feel comfortable until you go to God with it. It's called a conviction. But he'll never put condemnation on anybody. The devil does that, or people. But when God says, hey, it's time for you to deal with that, and we try to push it away, and then all of our life falls apart around us because we're not obeying God. Actually, we're rebelling against God. If God says, clean your room, and you keep rebelling it and not doing it, none of your prayers are going to be answered until you get that done. So answering prayer can be hindered by our own behavior of not obeying God. So we want to make sure we don't volunteer for that one. Can you say amen? Or right, how to appropriate his promises. It's not hard, so let's get into this. Romans 10, 14. Go with me there, please. Listen to this. How then shall we call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Say amen. Our job is to give the word out so people can believe. And sometimes, remember, when we have the word, it shows us what is ours. Remember the guy from Poland who was eating cheese when he could have been eating steak. And we have a lot of Christians eating cheese and crackers when they could be eating a little steak on the plate with a we. All right, so look at that. So point one, two, and three underneath Romans 10, 14 in your notes. The devil wants us to ignore and to be ignorant. Hosea 4, 6 says God's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Okay. Point two, church, as long as we are unknowing about truths, ignorant, we can be held in bondage. So the enemy tries to keep us in the dark. Thirdly, God sent his word and it healed them. Psalms 107 verse 20. How can we know what to apply and when to apply it without a preacher? Hello, somebody sharing the word, right? Let's drop down to verse 16 and 17. Same chapter, Romans 10. But they have all not obeyed the, the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing and hearing by the word of God. So let me add this in there. Let's say you didn't know that God wants you healed. But for healing, you got to do what? You got to get in the word because faith comes for healing by faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you got to go into the Word of God and find out what the Word of God says about your health. If you don't do that, just praying a prayer, you have nothing to base your stand on. Having done all to stand, stand. So if you're going to appropriate a promise, you're going to have to say, Lord, your Word says this. I'm reminding you that you always keep your Word. But Lord, I didn't know that, so I'm going to get the Word in me. So you start feeding the words of healing in you. Finding them in, you know, a good pocket promise book is a good one for that. Once you get that word in it, you can find your faith building. And it builds and it builds. And pretty soon you can see yourself healed when before all you could see yourself as troubled. But you, let's, say, let's say it's another thing, not just healing. Let's say it's your finances. Well, what does the Bible say about finances? Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you go in and you start reading and finding out scripture on your finances. <coughs> Amen. Feeding your faith, starving your doubts. When you do that, it's like your stomach. You bring the word into your spirit. Your spirit digests it, begins to 
flutter up into the eyes of your understanding, you begin to see pictures what God is saying about your health. He says, I wish that you prosper and be in health. He starts seeing scriptures and reading them. Then you start going to the Lord in prayer about these scriptures, and you start quoting them. Lord, your word says that he was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes I was healed. By his stripes I was healed. Well, Lord, by your stripes, I am healed. What are you doing? You're digesting the word. Your spirit's digesting it. You're coming up to the eyes of your understanding, and now you're being encouraged. Your faith is being built, and faith brings substance to the things you hope for and makes the evidence appear to the things you don't see. How did you get saved? Well, you believed in your heart. The Lord Jesus, or Jesus is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness. Faith, feeding your faith, and with the, heart, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Healing, soundness, wholeness, deliverance of being preserved. So you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Well, how are you doing today? Oh, pretty good out of the circumstances. You're not believing the word. Hello. I'm doing great. The word says I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out. The word says that by his stripes I was healed. Not one day I will be healed. So therefore I'm claiming was, was, was. Thank you, Lord, what your word says. You see what's happening? You're digesting it, it's coming up to your understanding, you're believing, it's bringing substance, and next thing you know, bam, it becomes a reality. How did you get saved? Just that way. How many here in this room wonder if they're saved or not? None of you. You're solid in that. Well, why can't the same principle that got you saved gets you healed? Same principle that got you saved, will change your finances. Same principle that got you saved, will bless your socks on. Will overwhelm you with things. Remember, your tongue will direct your life. So what are you saying? Are you saying the word? Or are you speaking against the word? Reasoning all the time. Hello, are you a grumbler? Then you'll be a stumbler. If you're a praiser, then God will be raising you. Can you say amen? Listen to this. Romans 10 verse uh, 6 says, But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. How does people who believe God speak? That if you confess with your mouth, this is verse 9 and 10, the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Now, everyone say the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, quote John 1, 1 for me. In the beginning was the, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So if you confess the word, you're confessing who? You're confessing the Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say Son, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It does in the New Testament. Because Jesus then was born in the earth and begotten. Have you ever wondered why? Is he only begotten of the Father? When, when the word was always, he was never born. So when did he become begotten? When he came into the earth. Hello? But he always was God. Can you say amen? But he was known in the beginning as the word. The father thought it. The word spoke it. And the Holy Spirit brought it to pass. Everyone in agreement with that? That's how it works. Well, that's how it works here on the earth. You believe and quote the word. You believe you receive you start thanking the Lord, praising the Lord. The word starts working in you and starts bringing substance to the things you hope for. It begins to manifest. Hello. That is, if you're not doing your own thing your own way, <laughs> hoping God's going to bless you someday. Let's move on past. All right, a couple of points. Number one, we got saved, born again, when we believed with our heart, confessed with our mouth. The same principle helps with you appropriating every promise that God gave you. The Bible said 
there's a ton of promises he gave Abraham, right? Have you ever read them all? Deuteronomy 28. Bless coming in, bless going out. You say, well, that's the Old Testament. Yeah, but if it, we be Christ, it says, then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to all the promises given to him comes through us in Christ. Can you say amen? amen. So you're blessed going in. You're blessed coming out. You're blessed your store, your business. You're blessed what you give. You bless what you see. If you got pets, they're blessed. I got a couple of birds. They they know it. Amen. Just throwing the birds in again. All right, let's move on. So we need to hold fast. Then, if we're going to appropriate a promise, you got now how to do it. We need to hold fast the confession of our faith, and that's where we blow it. One bad confession, or if you believe for something and you don't see it right off, well, don't complain. But you might wonder why. You know what I'd be doing? I'd be right at the feet of Jesus asking. Last thing I'd be doing is asking everybody else. Because a lot of times people don't, don't know what to tell you. But God does. <laughs> Amen. God told me a long t- time ago. I said, Lord, I was in the ministry. People wanted to make me something. And, I, and the church got really big and it got really blessed and everything. And then everything started falling apart. And he says, do you know why? And I says, yes, I kind of figured out. He says, everybody started doing their own thing for God and not doing God's thing that I wanted. And so kind of got all split up. And, of course, biggest offender here. So I'm not blaming anyone. I don't want to be at him. It was a woman you gave me, God. (laughs) My fault and a lot of things. But here's the deal. When you make a mistake, just say, Sorry, Lord. And he goes, that's all I want you to do. Instead of sweep, whatever we sweep under, God exposes. So whatever you try to hide, he's going to expose. And if you expose yourself, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about weird stuff. If you like say, Lord, I really need some help, then he covers us. But Lord, you walk around, eh, and you start acting prideful and strutful and all that kind of stuff. He'll expose how silly that is. Hello. So a house works. So expose yourself to God. So, Lord, I'm open. I'm naked before you. You know exactly what I need. Work on me. I mean, I tears come flying out of my... And so you know now how to appropriate salvation, don't you? Same way for healing. Same for every promise in that Bible. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Then hold fast to your confession, and we'll finish with this. All right. Hebrews 10, verse 23 through 25 says, Let us hold fast the confession, or saying the same thing of our hope, without wavering. Amen? Remember, faith is substance of things, what? Hope for. Hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as some manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. And Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God. See, there's the key. And actually in the, in the, in the Greek says, He who continually comes to God. Runs to God about everything. In fact, when the doors are open, they were there an hour before God showed up. No, I'm just kidding you. They're so desperate to run after God. You see, they are, look what it says, okay? It says, it's impossible to please him, for with a, he who comes to God must believe that he is, not was, not will be. There's a lot of people, one day God's going to heal me. Wrong words. You were healed over 2,000 years ago, now appropriated. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Well, how often shall I do that? Well, Peter, seven times seven? No, all day long. So let's move on. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and listen, he's a rewarder, a rewarder of those who diligently or excitingly seek him. Seek and you shall 
Find. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you have need of. So I pursue God first thing in the morning. I'm just pursuing him. And then what God told me is, you pursue me, you pursue my word, and I will manifest it in your life. But you've got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and hold fast to that confession. So let's make a good confession. Say, in the name of Jesus, say, I can do what God says I can do. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. My finances are blessed. My pets are blessed. My children are blessed. My parents are blessed, if they're still alive. You got that? My family is blessed. Lord, I thank you. I believe in my heart. I confess my life is blessed. My family is blessed. My finances are blessed. Father, because of Jesus. And see, so you start off that way. And every time you get a doubtful thought, you hold fast to that confession and just say, nope. Thank God. God's taking care of it. And you go, well, where is it? That helps us. You prayed for it. Where's it at? And you go, nope. Sorry. It's on its way. You hold fast to that confession. Well, did you get something out of that tonight?